So chapter 8 is where we're at in Matthew. Talked about how this is going to be about uh, three distinct healings that Jesus does. It's right on the heels of his three-chapter sermon. His Sermon on the Mount. Can you imagine if Peter or I sat up here and preached three chapters of Scripture? That's a long sermon old Jesus preached on that mountaintop. But a lot of filled with a lot of good stuff that we've learned over, over the last, what, three months, four months almost that it's taken us to go through those, those three chapters. And here he is coming off of that. He's actually, in Scripture it tells he's coming off the mountain almost. He's coming down from the mountain, and that's where we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 8. is him coming off the mountain. Verse 1 says, when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hands, touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And then Jesus entered Capernaum. A centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I can come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, the soldiers under me, and I say, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. I say to my slave, do this, and he does that. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith in, with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into the dark, outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, it shall be done as you, as you, it will be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. Then Jesus came into Peter's home. He saw that the mother-in-law lying in, sick in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. She got up and waited on him. And when the evening came, they brought, they brought to him many who were, were demon-possessed. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. This was for, to fulfill what was spoken through, the prophet, through the Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmaries and cleared away our diseases. So here we have this story of Jesus healing three distinct people, and then also a bunch later on in the evening, right, at the end of that passage. But we're going to look at just these three distinct healings of three different people. We're going to first start with the healing of the leper. The leper, this term is We've heard it many times in, in throughout Scripture, right, of this, of this disease that was, com that was not really common, but when someone was described as a leper, it was typically to a disease of their skin, right, of some sort. It wasn't like leprosy was this one disease. It was uh, uh, referred to as just the disease of the skin. And in the Old Testament times, it was a phys they were physically and ritually unclean. Because of this disease of the skin. Literally they had, this is going to sound gross, they literally had open sores oozing out liquid. Literally making them filthy. You can imagine that. Like literally they were dirty. Their, their, their clothes had just become soaked with that disgusting, uh, you know, stuff flowing out of their body. And so not only were they like physically dirty, their, body, their, their, their clothes were physically dirty, but then in Old Testament time, it was actually they were ritually dirty. So the, the leopards or the people with leprosy were very much frowned upon in Old Testament and New Testament time. They, they weren't even allowed in the cities. Many of them were outcast to colonies outside the city walls because they didn't want to socialize them because they were considered unclean. So this leopard comes in. And this, I remember it's a large crowd. They're coming off the mountain. 
Jesus said there, there, as they came off the mountain, there was this large crowd. So it was just for that leopard to become to Jesus in the months, this large crowd took some courage because that was not the norm of the day. That the lepers were not allowed to come. They're much less, they were like ostracized and cast out of society. So it took courage for that leper to come and mingle and come to Jesus amongst so many people. And even though this leper did this, he approaches, even though he is a leopard and he doesn't necessarily um, fit the bill of somebody coming before Jesus because of his condition, he comes to Jesus with great adoration and respect. You see this in the first part of this passage where he comes before him and he bowed down. Some versions say he kneeled down. He comes to Jesus in a, in, a, in, a process, in, in, a, in a manner of showing respect and adoration to who he is. Then he uses the word Lord. He recognizes who Jesus is. He just is not a normal person walking around. He recognizes him as the Lord. And then you see he also shows that he goes on to, um, he, he says, you can make me. So he has confidence. He approaches Jesus with confidence, knowing that you, he can make him. Of course, the next part of that would, if you are willing, he understood Jesus' sovereignty, that Jesus has a plan, that Jesus is in control, not him. He gives us a great example of how we should go to the throne. Humble. With adoration for the Lord God Almighty. He comes before him, telling him, you're the Lord. I know you are. He comes before him and says, you can make me. I know you can do this. But only if you're willing. We need to understand this. Is, this is the way we should approach the Lord. Because we serve him. He doesn't serve us. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, or nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts, my thoughts than your thoughts. God's thoughts and God's ways are way better than our ways. And and this leper gives us an example. He recognizes that. He, he sees that, that God, whatever you do, I just want to make sure you're willing to do it. Don't do it on my part, my account. So then Jesus reaches out, touching the leopard. Let's just pause there for a second. Of my description of what this leopard looked like, would the first thing you want to do is lay your hands on this person? No one's shaking their heads, but many, many, many of us on our side are probably going, nah, that's not exactly what I want to do, is put my hand on an oozing body of fluids. Not to mention the, the ramifications of what that meant in Old Testament times. In Levit Leviticus chapter 13, leprosy is a picture of sin. It's this disease that it gets on our skin, it gets on the outside, and it spreads throughout the whole body. And it defiles the entire body. Isn't that what sin does? Starts in a small spot in our hearts, and it radiates out from our hearts and infects us all. It infects your body, it infects this body, it infects the church's body, it infects the whole world. This leprosy, when Jesus touches him with a disease that was very much a no-no for anyone to stay clean. But Jesus reaches out and touches him. And as soon as he touches him, he's healed instantly. And he gives him instructions on what not to do. Don't go out. Don't go out and, 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 and tell everyone. Just go show yourself to the priest and present the offering like you're supposed to do. Kind of a humbled way of going about doing things. 
So you look at this first four verses, what, what are we to get out of this? And I, when I looked at this, I just think, man, Jesus and the leopard, they took a risk. They took a risk. Jesus took a risk in willing to heal a guy, touch a guy like this. The leopard took a risk just coming and being in front and in the crowd where he knew he could easily be ostracized for what he had chosen to do. They didn't conform to the normal social status or normal, normal social norms. They very much butted up against them. They said, no, this is what we need to do. This is what I, I, I need to do. Jesus says, or he, he does this through his actions. I don't know, I'm going to heal this guy. He, had the, he came up to me. And he, he came in the way that I want people to come to me with, with admiration and with respect and with recognizing and confidence. He had faith that Jesus was going to do something. How many of you, oops, sorry, have been changed by the touch, by the touch of Jesus? There's one hand. There's a couple more back there. Yeah. All of us here, hopefully some days raising our hands saying, I've been touched and changed by Jesus. When we open up to Jesus, he will change us. Scripture is very clear about when we come to know him, we leave our old behind and a new comes forth, a new life in Christ. That's being touched by Jesus. One of the most impactful touches in Jesus in my life is outside of me coming to know him and having faith in him. Was I can remember this one time being spread out. And some of you may have heard this testimony before, but I was spread out on the bed. And I'll backtrack for a second. We just found out that we were going to have our fourth child, Caleb. And, and uh, I, I was also at the same time, God had been calling me out. I worked for the Forest Service, calling me out of the Forest Service, resigning from the Forest Service and going into ministry full time. So I was leaving the good Forest Service job with the good benefits, the good health insurance and all that stuff. But by the way, Ken, you're going to have a kid and all that. And by the way, you're going to have that child about two weeks before you're supposed to start the school that I'm sending you to. And move from Salmon, Idaho to Kansas City, Missouri. So to say at least, I was a little bit kind of thrown back. God, what are you doing? And what do you want me to do about it? And I just remember, my wife tells the story better than I do, but she came upstairs to our bedroom, and I'm laying flat down, face buried in the cupboard, in, in the, on the bed, just like this. God, what do you want me to do? And I don't remember hearing like an audible voice or a touch, but I just have this peace rush over me that I got you, you know. I, I have you in this hard time. It's not that hard for me. I don't know why you're making a big deal about it. I can just remember him kind of making me very much at peace that he was going to take care of all those things that I just said. Insurance, good job, kid coming, timing. I mean, it all worked out. He came two weeks early, so we had plenty of time to prepare to leave. It's just all those things God worked out. But I was worried about it, and I was nervous about it, and I had all these ideas that what am I going to do about it? And I just remember having this piece like, you don't have to do nothing. You just got to trust me with it. The second healing comes to a centurion servant. A centurion is an officer in the Roman guard. He's a soldier. He, he, can, he typically commands a hundred, the centurion name, a hundred soldiers under, under his command. The centurion obviously had heard about Jesus. He just didn't show up in Capernaum and go to him expecting this normal whatever guy that people were chasing around the city to do something about his servant. He knew Jesus was something special. However, he learned about it, whether he learned about it from other centurions talking about this guy or whether he had witnessed other miracles, he knew Jesus was something different. That's why he went to him. So he goes to Jesus, tells him about his sick servant. He makes a request of him, but he doesn't like Jesus' response really, right? <clears throat> he says, Jesus, I'll come to you. He, he says, Jesus says, to him, yeah, I'll come heal him. But the servant says, no, no, Lord, I'm not worthy why don't you just use your words? I'm paraphrasing here. Why don't you just say some words in verse, <coughs> in verse uh, 8? I believe it is, yeah, verse 8. Why don't you just use your words 
to him to heal him. Just speak it and it will happen. How does this centurion know that Jesus has the power to heal with words? But he does. How many of you have siblings? Or if you didn't have siblings, you have kids, your kids behave this way. There's that bathroom battle, right? I don't know if you had one bathroom, two bathrooms, but I don't care if you had 16 bathrooms. There's always a bathroom battle in a house full of families, right? And, and then siblings are wanting to get in the bathroom. How many times have you heard this, this maybe, ah, they're bickering over the bathroom door, and, and finally dad maybe yell up or mom yells up, tell her to get out of the bathroom or tell him to get out of the bathroom. His time is up. And that sibling tells that sibling inside there, dad said get out of the bathroom. You're done. And that word, dad said, had a little bit more authority than Amy telling Nikki, get out of the bathroom, right? When dad said, I can remember as a kid when my mom said, when your dad gets home, uh, there's a difference there. Well, Jesus was willing to speak and heal this man. He says, he wanted to go to him. Centurion says, no, no, I'm not worthy. Why can't you just speak into him? The, the, the centurion, he understood authority, right? We see that in this passage in verse 9. He understood when he told his soldiers, go. Scripture says, he says they go, and they went. He says, come, and they came. He told his servants, do that, and they did it. Centurion understood the authority to speak something and have an action take place. He very much knew that was, and he, you don't need to have much. He knew exactly what Jesus could do because he had that same authority with his soldiers and his servants. You don't have to go to him, Centurion says. He says, just speak, speak it. He will be healed. See, the Centurion wasn't Jewish. He's most likely a Gentile. He was most likely as a Roman officer, not very well liked by the Jewish people, and they're in a Jewish town, Capernaum, a Roman-controlled town, but still many Jewish people living in this town. He wouldn't have been liked by the average Jewish person, but Jesus not only grants his request to the centurion, okay, I'll speak it, but he tells the centurion he has great faith. Great faith. In verse 10 it says, I have not found anyone in Israel. Now that's a bold statement. I haven't found anyone in Israel. Basically, I haven't found any of you Jews and Jewish people out here, is what he's telling them, to have the faith of this Gentile Roman soldier that you guys don't like. Jesus tells them, this guy's got faith like you guys need. He's telling us, the centurion's got faith like we need. If you get nothing more from this sermon tonight, get this. This passage should remind us that Jesus is willing to offer a blessing and a healing to anyone that comes to him in faith. It may not be the blessing and healing that we want, but he will offer a blessing and healing of his desire. No one receives forgiveness automatically. You have to trust in Jesus. You have to give faith. You have to put your faith and trust in Jesus. That just doesn't fall out of the sky. We have to trust him with our lives. We have to turn away from our old lives. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you're going through, but we must go to him in faith. The centurion servant was then healed when Jesus says, Go, it shall be done as you have believed. See, the centurion believed that Jesus could do that. And not that he's going to do it to everyone just because he believed, but Jesus in this, in, this, in this instance says, look, I understand who this guy is. He's got greater faith than people that say they, who they know me and they know my, my father. And this guy doesn't even proclaim that. He just knows that I can come, he can come to me and ask. 
and not even ask for me to come and touch the guy. He's not even expecting me to touch him. He just says, say some words. The third healing, Peter goes in, or uh, Jesus goes into Peter's house in verse 14. He sees Peter's mother-in-law sick in bed. She's got a fever. He walks by her or whatever he does and touches her hand. And that fever leaves her. Now she was just lying there, sick in bed, and the fever goes away. But look at the next verse. She got up and waited on him. Now, I, I'm just, I'll just admit, I, when I get over a sickness, typically I don't, I, I, I play that sickness for a while, right? Like, I, my body just doesn't really quickly snap out of it. And I'm like, woohoo, honey, what do you want for dinner tonight? I'll cook you up something. No, I'm still like, I feel a little better. My fever's gone, but I feel like I could do something, but I'm not 100%. But Jesus, like, whatever she got sick a week ago, let's say, and she was healthy running the house like she normally would do. She was instantly back to that place right then and there by Jesus just touching her and her fever gone. She's up out of bed and she's doing and serving the Lord. He quickly gets up and she does what she needs to do. She's feeling much better immediately. And that evening, Jesus then goes on to heal Many, many more, Scripture tells us, the demon possessed, he casts out the spirits with just a word, and, and he speaks to him. And he says this in verse 17, this was to fulfill the prophet, the prophet that was spoken by Isaiah. He himself had said, took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. And there's so much more to that that he carried away. But in this literal sense, he's talking about these physical elements that the, Jesus took away from these people. That, that they came to Peter's house that evening. He healed them. There's lots of issues we could cover under this passage. It's a long passage. It's 17 verses. There, I, we could go on and on. We could talk about how Jesus ministered to three different groups of people that weren't valued in the Jewish society at that time. The leopard, the Gentile, women. I could talk about how Matthew's account compares to the other accounts. Like this is not just the only account to these healings. They're, they're throughout the scriptures. Luke, Mark, both have these, these passages and parallel this in Matthew. We could compare all those and how, what was said by Luke and what was said by Mark and how Matthew was such a detailed person, how he details it much different than, than Mark or, or Luke did. We could talk whether or not Jesus heals every time someone has an affliction. We could talk about a lot of different issues from this thing, but I want to focus on two out of this passage. The first one is, Go to Jesus for healing. If you are suffering from something, and I'm not just talking about physical here. If you are suffering from something, go to Jesus for healing. I'm not saying don't go to a doctor. I'm not saying go to a physician. Those are gifts from God, but we must first go to him. He is the ultimate physician. Submit your request to him. Be like the leper and say, Lord, if you're willing, please heal me. Jesus may very well heal you right then and there, on that spot, in that second, like he did Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus may heal you through natural means that he's given us. Jesus may say, my child, I want you to wait until the ultimate healing will be demonstrated when I come again and every pain and disease and physical element will be wiped from forever away. In any case, go to him for healing and have faith that he can heal you. 
But more than any other healing that we ask for him, ask him from healing from our sins. Ask him to heal our hearts. The greatest healing of all time is the healing of a sinful heart. It does no good to be cured of physical blindness when we are still walking around spiritually blind. It does no good to overcome a heart attack when our hearts are still spiritually hard. Go to Jesus for healing. Go to Jesus to experience the greatest healing of all time, and that is our, from our sin nature. And, and our, 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 our hearts that we've been born with, that he gives us an opportunity to be with the Father through him. Go to him for healing. First and foremost. The second thing is have faith in Jesus. Do you have faith in Jesus? Have you come to, to know him through admitting that you are a sinner? Through believing that he died on a cross and that our sins were nailed to that cross with him and that he was stuck in a grave and he rose three days later to ascend to the Father later? Are you committed and confirmed that I want that? I'm committed to following you, Jesus Christ, above all else? We must first have faith in Jesus. And do we really believe that? Like, do we really have that idea that if I go in faith to Jesus, do we really believe that he can do all things? If you don't believe that, ask, first and foremost, the Holy Spirit to increase your faith. Ask God to, to show you ways that you need to step out in faith. Whatever that might be, it might be a, it could be a ton of different things, whether to be healed, whether to to new job, whether it could be walking away from something or some situation. It takes a step of faith for us to do that first. And our first step of faith is to grab on to Jesus and say, let's go. Look, these healings are awesome. But it's child's play for what Jesus can do and accomplish when we put our trust and faith in his life. I go back home sometimes. When I go back home and I, I visit my parents and I see um, childhood, other, my, my parents' friends that were, were friends with them and when I was a child. And they used to see me run around and, and just think, man, that kid is a mess skateboarder, hair down like this over my face, long bangs, running around, all dressed in black, skateboarding around town, just, you know, doing great things. Yeah, right. Just a havoc. And then they hear about now this guy's preaching in front of people and teaching them about the gospel. Jesus can do all things. He can change anything. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and there are things in your life that you think cannot be fixed. Let me make this real clear. Let me tell you, Jesus can fix it. Jesus can heal you from relationship problems. Jesus can heal you from addictions. Jesus can heal you from physical ailments. Jesus can heal you from emotional hurts. Jesus can heal you from confusion about spiritual things. He can heal you from suffering of abuse. He can heal your headache. He can heal your toothache, but most importantly, he can heal our heartaches. He is going to fix it. It may not just be the way we think it should be fixed. Until we go to faith in him and think, man, Lord, I really want this to be fixed this way. I really wish you would do it like this. Is that really going in faith? Or is it going in a box? Here, Jesus, I'll give you what I want. 
Now do it. Like we need, like God needs our help to figure things out. He didn't just need our help. But when we, he will hear you when you go to him in faith. And he'll take care of it. He'll fix the problem. It may not be our way, but it'll be his way. And like Isaiah said, his ways are higher than our ways. His ways are better than our ways. And they'll always be better than our ways. When we think we can outthink God on how to fix something, we've lost sight of who he really is. The bottom line is, have faith in Jesus and his great power. We have to have faith in him. We can trust in his power to fix things. We can trust in his power to heal things. Jesus has demonstrated this over and over and time and time again. We just saw three quick examples of him. He does so much more than that. Calming the waters, walking on water. Trust him to heal you in his timing, according to his ways, for his will, for his purposes, and for his glory. Have faith in what Christ has for you. Let's pray.